talking about today is interdomain measurement analysis and control, uh, improving connectivity uh, at your borders, with whom, where, at what speed, uh, how to improve your interconnections with other people. Uh, what we're not talking about today is MPLS, DIFSERV, RSVP, CRLDP, and all sorts of other acronyms with a bunch of capital letters that have become associated with traffic engineering. Traffic engineering is clearly a very, very big subject, and in the next 90 minutes we will cover a very, very small portion of it, but hopefully we'll cover it reasonably well. Uh, goals for the afternoon, uh, methods and concepts on how to improve interdomain connectivity, uh, and depending on who you are, improve will have different meanings. If you're a Tier 1 ISP, improve might mean uh, catching people defaulting traffic at your borders onto you for routes you didn't announce. Uh, if you're a small ISP, uh, it might mean finding the right people to peer with or to buy transit from or to get settlement-based peering from that you get the most bang for your buck. Uh, another goal, finding ways to reduce impact uh, of failure in peer transit networks. You know, how, what things can you do in order to keep uh, your neighbor networks from uh, from uh, having trouble reaching you. And some of the stuff we're going to do has some oper operational complexity, so uh, keep that in mind. And if you're squeamish about such things, uh, you know, put on your glasses. Uh, presentation outline. We're going to talk about defining goals for interdomain TE. Uh, we're going to talk about how to measure to uh, get data that will answer those goals and those problem statements. We're going to apply data to those goals. We're going to talk about eliciting control and uh, redefining your goals once you've measured and gotten some quantitative data. Uh, we're going to talk about some conceptual examples, some people who are doing this stuff, uh, some sort of live network examples, and uh, in the end, hopefully, there will be some questions, but not just a ton. Uh, so interdomain traffic engineering goals definition, a problem statement. Uh, you can measure a lot of data. What you need to be able to do is measure data that answers questions that you have and need to answer. Uh, and there, there's, there's, there's a bit of a format to doing this. You define a goal, you measure information that applies to your goal, you analyze it, you refine your goals, because often you'll find that what you thought was the right answer uh, qualitatively ended up not being the right answer quantitatively. And then you elicit some action to uh, improve your network, hopefully. So step one, defining goals. What is it you need to accomplish? Uh, examples of some goals, uh, you know, I need to offload my NSF net peering links outbound because they're congested. Uh, NSF net seemed like a nice politically correct word to use in that spot in the sentence. Um, obviously, no one has that problem. Uh, another goal, uh, I need to expand my interdomain peering links clueful,ly right? I'm ready to expand my network. I'm ready to grow my interdomain links. Who do I go connect to uh, and where and at what speed and why? Uh, don't just go to the people who seem like the right people because that's where everyone else connects. Uh, that's an expensive way to do business. And uh, a third goal, you know, hey, I need to find some people. I need to ad identify some sales opportunities. Seems like a strange thing to talk about in a traffic engineering discussion, but, you know, when it comes right down to it, we're all here to put products on the market. Uh, once you've defined a goal, don't be afraid to adjust your assumptions once you've started measuring. Uh, uh, you know, just what you plan to do and what you end up doing may change substantially, and that's okay. Um, clue about doing all this stuff should increase as valid network data becomes available and consulted. And I just can't stress this enough. There's just a ton of people out there who go through all the trouble of measuring and collecting data and never use it. And they've just created a truckload of work for themselves that, you know, doesn't help and actually probably hurts them quite a bit because uh, they don't use it. Uh, what sort of data should I collect? Uh, for, the, for the purposes of what we're doing and, and what we're trying to do, we need flow export data or some generic traffic accounting information. Uh, we need BGP routing data. Uh, we can use active measurement data, uh, ping, trace route going out and measuring the product of what you're offering, measuring through your network, and some amount of SNMP niceties to get nice titles for things. Uh, there's some public tools available for this, CFLOW-D, Zebra, Ping, Traceroute, Scotty, all number of things. There are some commercial products available that do this sort of stuff as well. And uh, so once you've defined a goal, and you know we can choose any goal we want, uh, you need to go measure data that will help you solve that problem. If you don't have a problem statement, you're just going to end up with a ton of data that you don't know how to use in the right way. So you know, better domain TE measurement or getting good problem goal specific data. Can everybody hear me? The person in the back is supposed to wave their hand and say, yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Um, 
so the assumed network model, uh, you know, th there's just a, a zillion of them, but the one that seems to be sort of prevalent and the one that we worked with the most is the hierarchical network model. Uh, here, your ingress and egress network services are separated from your transit services. Uh, worse than others, but, you know, this is what we're going to focus on. So here's a nice little picture that I drew. Um, you have your core network services, uh, and the access to those is relegated by core routers, and the access into your transport service or your transit service. Uh, is by edge routers, whether they be peer routers, gateway routers, web hosting routers, customer aggregation routers, whatever. Uh, and your interdomain links or your customer links are off of the edge. Uh, that model works really well for measurement and analysis and the sort of things we want to do. We'll talk about a couple of other models. Actually, we'll talk about another model, uh, which is much harder to work with. Uh, so types of data to measure, again, routing data. Our focus here is BGP. and. You know, I, I suppose if someone here has the need to use IDRP or, you know, heaven forbid, EGP, you could do the same general sort of thing with it, but obviously, you know, BGP4 is our, is our focus here. Traffic data, we're using uh, NetFlow, Flow Export V5 here. Uh, again, any sort of traffic accounting information is helpful, uh, whether it be TCP dump or, you know, whatever you want to use, uh, as long as you can get some amount of traffic load information. And then active measurement and performance data, ping, trace route, one-way delay, jitter, all the things that are statements about the quality of, you, of the product of your services as opposed to the devices. Uh, routing data. Routers do this reasonably well. I mean, it's the core competency by design of what a router is. Routers should route. And if they don't, you should probably get a different kind of router. Um, different data sets are available for measurement, uh, IBGP, route reflection, EBGP. IBGP works really well when your problem statement is, I want to measure things outbound. I want to see exit off of my network. Uh, and when you're measuring flow data and routing data from the same device and your question is outbound, IBGP is definitely the way to go. Route reflection, another way to go. If you're trying to answer an inbound question, uh, obviously traffic coming, the destination address coming into your network is going to map to a route. IBGP won't communicate that information to you. You have to use route reflection to cleanly get internal routes from your device. Uh, choose the right one to measure based on your needs and goals. So, you know, same general picture. If I'm, if I'm trying to answer this question of traffic coming in from AS3 to my peer box 2, uh, in order for me to see what routes and what AS paths traffic maps to across my core network, I need to use route reflection. Pretty basic BGP stuff. Uh, if I'm answering the reverse question of traffic coming from my core network services into Peer 2 over the thick links going out to these ASs, those are external links, and as long as they've been marked, a marked active, my BGP collector will get those routes, and all I need is standard IBGP because those routes are announced to me that way. Uh, so, uh, said in a longer sentence, when your goal is outbound characterization and your measurement point is the exit point for traffic, IBGP is the person you want to work with. Uh, I honestly thought that this was funny when I wrote it. Protocols hate being anthropomorphized. I really thought that was funny a couple of weeks ago. I appreciate your sympathy laugh. Uh, when your goal is inbound characterization and your measurement point is the entry point for traffic, route reflection must be used. Same picture, you know, same idea. When you're coming in and your measurement point is peer two, if you're looking at traffic coming in, you need to know about internal routes. That means you need route reflection. If you're looking outbound, you're looking at external routes. That means IBGP will suffice. IBGP, you know, N by IBGP is a lot easier to do than N by route reflection just by number of paths. Uh, just slightly off topic, but it was a good place to mention this, uh, the concept of full mesh uh, BGP monitoring uh, and the value of it. You know, by full mesh, I mean, hey, you know, I have a whole bunch of blue boxes and they're all sending IBGP routes to the collector. You get a full view of what your domain is doing. You can track routes historically. You can go back and look for historical problems. You can do policy benchmarking, say, hey, you know, I want to know when something bad has happened. Tell me. I want to know when I hear default from the wrong place. I want to know if I hear default at all. I want to know if I'm hearing, you know, UUNETS routes through cable and wireless, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, tracking med selection issues, that's a really good way to do that. Um, but just bottom line, uh, identifying disasters the first time cluefully, um, there's just so many people out there who have really bad routing mess-ups, and uh, they just, you know, they sort of wait for it to happen again to see if they can catch it in the act, and it hurts everybody. So it's a global table. Please, you know, do a little bit of measurement and try and, try and head things off at the pass. Uh, a little off topic, but I, I actually felt like it was sort of important to mention. Uh, again, the pull mesh picture. That one was easy to draw. 
Uh, traffic accounting data. Uh, once you have routing information, you need traffic accounting information. You could call it flow export, you could call it net flow, you could call it C flow. I call it a major pain in my ass. Um, you could also use S flow, you could use, you know, any sort of traffic accounting information. We used flow export because we were working with Cisco's and Junipers. Uh, the quick skinny on flow is basically packet and byte counters per unique set of traffic attributes, source IP, dust IP, source port, dust port, et cetera. Uh, it's measured from strategic routers per input interface currently. Uh, which interfaces depends on your defined goals and needs, and we'll get a little bit more into that in a second. And uh, there's a lot of historical complaints about flow export, and believe me, I understand it, but it really has come quite a long way in the last couple of years. It is not, you know, it is not your grandfather's flow export technology. Um, it works a lot better than it did in 99. So if you know, if you heard from someone once upon a time, gosh, you know, NetFlow can't do that, that's bad, you know, things have, ch things have changed a little bit over time. Uh, so, uh, collecting flow export information as per your problem statement. Uh, if I'm doing inbound measurement, I'm going to, all I need to do is collect inbound on a single interface uh, for each AS I'm concerned about. If, if I want to find out the characteristics of traffic coming in from AS3, all I need to do is measure, uh, do flow export inbound on the AS3's link and export that off. Uh, that'll, that'll answer that question. That's really easy to do. Similarly, in the hierarchical network model, uh, if you want to answer the outbound question, it's pretty easy to do too because there's only two links that can contribute to ex external load off of peer two. Uh, and in any sane network, your core network services will never transit your edge box. So any traffic that's coming in those two interfaces is destined either for that router or for one of the exit points off that router. So in this model, IBGP and a low number of interfaces will give you all the information you need. We're going to get to that. Um, yeah, we can talk later about overlapping problem statements. That's a, a different story. Uh, this is an example of a non-hierarchical network, obviously. Uh, ANS back in the day was sort of an example of this, uh, where your core services and your edge services come off of the same box. Your peering links and your transit links are on the same router, and that can cause some operational complexity because you don't know necessarily that traffic coming in one backbone link is going off the box. It may transit through to another core box. And if you're measuring on more than one core box, that means you have the opportunity to double count flows. If traffic comes in, you know, uh, I wish I had one of those laser pointers, but uh, uh, if traffic comes in one core box that you're, and you're measuring on that link uh, because that has the opportunity to contribute to one of your external links and traffic is, uh, you don't know what traffic is staying on that box or going off net there and what traffic is staying on net. If you're measuring at the next router, uh, you have the opportunity to count the same flow on two interfaces and that can skew your data. Um, so that's harder. Uh, said again, since flow export data is inbound only, all potential feeder links in a non-hierarchical mixed services device have to be accounted for in order to catch all outbound traffic, right? In order to know what's going on in the AS2 link, I have to measure on all of the core interfaces, uh, assuming that none of the other ASs off that are getting transit from me. Uh, one issue uh, is how do you know what data is coming in core link 4 or core link X is bound for the ex local external link. And, uh, Route reflection is bad here because you can double count. If you're doing route reflection from core box in red and the one below it, uh, you're going to get uh, you're going to get the flow applied to an AS path on box one. Then you're going to get the flow applied to the same AS path on box two. And that means you've double counted, and that you know you don't you don't want to do all this only to see your numbers inflated by you know two. So uh, yeah. And the problem only gets exacerbated by complex policy. If you have BGP policy on your network where you have different policies per box, you don't have global policy, uh, that only makes this problem worse. Uh, words are less on flow data. Uh, micromanagement of networks based on flow data is bad. Uh, if you take every single flow and you try and make network decisions, macro level decisions based on micro flows, you will never finish. It will create a terrible hysteresis on your network and it will be a ton of work. It's just a losing proposition to try and engineer your network based on flow, on individual flows. Macro management of networks based on flows is good. Looking at long-term trends, looking at long-term information and aggregating data so that you can see the three and six and nine and 12 month 
uh, trends in your network, that is a winning proposition. It's a lot less work and the value to you is much, much higher. Uh, so some operational challenges with flow export data and doing this stuff. Uh, Gilb's law, which is a good thing to preface, uh, is anything can be measured in a way that is superior to not measuring it at all, which I think is absolutely true. Um, so some operational challenges, uh, access lists and data export in the great beast. Uh, the Cisco 12000 router uh, ha can do a whole bunch of different things, but it can only do one of the great many things. Uh, and sampled NetFlow on the GSR is usually distributed on the line cards, right? You've got, a, you've got a fabric on the box and it all goes around the GRP. But uh, if you have any kind of access list, ex ex export access list, outbound access list on any interface, flow export won't work on any interface. Um, and you know, th this little slide shows that, uh, you know, if you have access lists configured on a router, sample net flow won't work. And a lot of people have a lot of access lists running. Uh, if you have sample net flow running, I don't even know what perk is, but it won't work. Uh, and that is greater than IP coloring, which is greater than BGP policy accounting, which is greater than frame relay traffic policing, which is not frame relay traffic shaping, apparently. Uh, and I guess some of this changed in a 12018S, but a lot of people are running a lot of old code. So just be aware of the fact that uh, access lists can seriously uh, kill what you're trying to do with sampled NetFlow. Uh, just being vendor neutral, uh, some releases of Genos have bugs where uh, it can't export data on all the interfaces you configure on it. Uh, look up PR20159 if you think you might be uh, subject to that. I've seen it in uh, 5.1.R1, uh, but not in 4.4, so whatever version of code you're running, check it out. Uh, on high-speed interfaces, the best you can realistically sample is some ratio uh, less or greater than one-to-one. -one. Uh, when you get up to high-speed interfaces, OC48, OC192, uh, the idea of accounting every packet that comes in starts to interfere with the concept of forwarding it, and quite frankly, forwarding has to take precedence over accounting because accounting a whole bunch of packets that never get forwarded doesn't help you, right? So uh, if you need to count bytes, this is going to introduce errors. If you're trying to do something like a billing system, if you're trying to do something that is packet and byte sensitive, this is going to be a problem for you. But if you're trying to do traffic engineering, if you're trying to do capacity planning or congestion mitigation, it's okay. There's, people really seem to fear sampling, but as long as you're not bit sensitive to it, it's okay. Um, uh, what you need to do is basically compare samples and make sure that the samples are normalized. If you have a 7500, 7500 doesn't do sampling. It does one-for-one -one packet analysis. The GSR, I'm fairly certain you can't even configure one-for-one. -one. Uh, so if you have some number of 7500s doing flow or some number of GSRs doing flow, you need to combine the data together in order to make it normalized so it can be compared to each other, right? Just like multiplying the denominator and fraction so you can compare the numerator. Uh, I, you, just if you, if you come away with nothing else in this conversation than this, I guess it's not a conversation unless someone talks, but um, normalizing the data does not mean multiplying by the sample interval. Uh, the distri distribution of packets uh, is not such that you can say, hey, I'm doing one in 100, so in order to get the real number, I'm just going to multiply uh, all my values by 100. It, it, just, it just doesn't work that way. And uh, if anyone wants to talk about it some more, I can draw some pictures later. But uh, uh, that, that, that it just doesn't work that way. Uh, but one way that you can normalize traffic that seems to work reasonably well as long as you're not bit and byte sensitive is to take the load and the speed of your interface and take comparable values off an interface. So let's say I had 10 AS paths across an interface and each of them represented 10% uh, of, the, of the interface load. If you take the actual interface load that you get via SNMP and take 10% of that, you can normalize your data to say, well, I know what traffic actually was on that interface, and I know relative to each other on that interface what traffic was for each AS path. I can divide that in by percentage, right? That seems to be a reasonable way to do long-term planning and normalizing flow statistics. Uh, there's some non-trivial lack of current research on statistical validity and flow data based on samples. Uh, Casey and some of her friends did a nice paper in 1993 uh, that talked about uh, sampling validity in, in the ANS net network, uh, but that was a long time ago, and it actually predates substantial HTTP traffic on, on backbones. So, I mean, basically, we have very large, very high-capacity core links. We have very large, very high-capacity peering links. We have customer links, and all of them are going to have different traffic characteristics. So all of them are going to have different traffic granularities. 
and knowing what a valid statistical sampling rate on each one of those types of links would be really, really valuable. And if anyone has some copious spare time, please go do that. Um, at any rate, so the question of, well, what's a valid sampling rate? That's a really good question. And it would be really good if some people started sitting down to work on that. Or if they already are, that's great. Uh, so I, again, tried to be funny. Uh, so we talked about Gilb's law, and uh, I made up the gilb wetman construct, and that is the total PETA factor experienced through the process of network measurement is far less than the total PETA factor experienced through planning and engineering a network without network measurements. Uh, tough, clueful statements and uh, easy, clueless statements. I'll take the tough, clueful statements anytime. And PETA, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, uh, pain in the ass. And uh, for those, uh, those of you without customers may not be familiar with it, but uh, anyway, I find this to be very, very true. Uh, performance data, uh, active measurement, round trip, uh, one way, ping, trace route, uh, all the things that you put a probe out and measure through your network to verify the performance of your entire network. Uh, MRTG and link utilization were things saturated, you know, are my links approaching satur saturation. Uh, really important stuff, but sadly not part of our examples as we ran out of time because we had to do our day jobs. Josh, can you talk into this? It's hard to hear you in the back. Oh, really? Yeah. That guy can hear me. Sure. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Is, is this better? It's on, right? It's on here. Oh. How about now? How about now? I, I can try and yell. Hello? Is this thing on? I, I'll just yell, or I'll try to yell. If, if anybody's having trouble hearing me, please give a yell, and I'll yell louder. Uh, performance data is really important for this stuff, but we just didn't have time to get to it, so my apologies. Uh, but, you know, it really helps in goal selection. It really helps you identify problems. Uh, and it really helps in goal reselection, you know. And bottom line is, you know, you use this stuff to figure out, am I making things better or worse? You know, I've brought up new peering, I've moved traffic around, I've done this or that. Uh, you know, quantitatively, I'm measuring my network. Have I made things better? If you have, then you're winning. If you haven't, then you're not, obviously. Uh, applying data to your goals. Once you've defined a goal statement, once you know your problem, and once you've started measuring, and once you've started getting good data, at some point, you're going to have to glue those together, right? How do I use my data to solve my problem? And uh, for the, focusing on what we're doing here, we're taking traffic accounting data and we're applying it to routing attributes and routes, right? How much load is representative per AS path, BGP next hop, community, community list, whatever, whatever it is that you need to do. Our focus here is on traffic statistics, byte and packet rates per AS path. That's what allows us to do the how do we find people to connect with and how do we optimize our interdomain connectivity. Uh, so uh, traffic data tables for AS paths. Uh, we take traffic load per AS path. We get every individual flow. We take the destination address and we do a route lookup in real time and we find the AS path attribute for that and we apply the packet and byte counters to that AS path. So what that gives me is uh, a bunch of uh, AS path load values, which I can overlay on top of each other to make a tree structure. And uh, once I've done that, I can see that all the traffic that's terminating in an AS, all the traffic that's going through an AS, and, you know, the product of the two. So if I have some AS path 101 that has X bits per second, some AS path 101, 1234, which has Y bits per second, and 101, 1234, 9995, which has Z bits per second, I can overlay those on top of each other and see that the traffic syncing to 101 is X, the traffic transiting 101 is Y plus Z, and the total traffic aggregation that's going to or through that AS is X plus Y plus Z. And I can do this for every branch and every structure of the tree. Um, so this addresses the middle mile ASs instead of the traditional first neighbor or edge destination AS, right? Uh, all the middle ASs in the path I can now see, so I can see the full set of relationships instead of just how people sync out to the destinations. Because when I'm, when I'm a large ISP or even a small ISP, I'm not looking necessarily, when my, when my goal is interdomain expansion, I don't necessarily care about the sinks. 
What I care about is the aggregation points. Where do I get the biggest bang for my buck? Uh, so once again, it allows two and through values instead of just two values. Uh, so flow export, V5, you get all these individual flow records, uh, and you've got all this routing information. Uh, but what, like I said before, micromanaging networks based on flow data and routing data, well, not necessarily routing data, but flow data is very, very bad. So you need to aggregate data over time, and anyone who's ever used CFlowD is probably familiar with this concept. Uh, uh, when you aggregate data over time frames, you want long term. Now, long term may be a day for you because maybe you made a change and you're looking to see what the result is. Uh, it may be three months because. Hi, how are you doing? Um, okay, so uh, so you can do long term averages, three months. I want to know next quarter who should I go after for peering or who should I go after to buy capacity from if that's what you need to do. Um, or uh, short-term benchmarks, right? Uh, you know, and by short-term, I mean sort of long-term because micromanaging networks via flows is bad. Uh, data aggregation via interfaces. <laughs> um, aggregating across the set of interfaces that represent your problem statement, and this is something that Tracy mentioned earlier. Uh, you, it may be one interface. I may want to look at the AS lo or the traffic load in from ASX, right? Uh, or maybe I want to aggregate. Uh, uh, all the interfaces on a router together because my router serves a, a given function and I want to see what traffic is going through that router. Uh, or, uh, you know, maybe I want to aggregate every interface I'm measuring in the entire domain because what I really want to know is given all the traffic I have for all the places that I'm measuring, where is my best opportunity, excuse me, for expansion? Um, and what's most common, I think, is to do N of M interfaces where, or M of N, whatever. Uh, where you know you're taking three of seven links off of a router and aggregating those together because those three links answer the question that you're trying to answer. They apply to your problem statement. Uh, so you know what do we do with all this? You know once you've measured all this information, uh, you know once you've got it all aggregated and you've got you know some amount of traffic uh, and some some amount of uh, traffic engineering information, what does one go do? And with that, I will hand off to my good friend Joe. Right. You might forget that. Yeah. Is that good? Yes, working? Good. Everybody hear me okay? Okay. So the, the very second slide we had talk, called me a token Canadian, and I may not sound like a Canadian. And that's because I'm in disguise. So, we have some assumptions about the routing architecture. Um, the routes to our external networks are in BGP. The routes, uh, IGB basically tells us how to find the next top uh, for the routes that we have in BGP. Um, we, exit, we select exit points for traffic based on BGP path selection. And, uh, and that's an assumption that I think is fairly reasonable. Um, if your network differs really substantially from that, then you have other problems to solve before you start measuring things. So, basically I'm trying to talk about a little toolbox here of what we can do to change things. Um, if we've made some measurements and we decided that uh, traffic needs to flow in some different way to the way it's currently flowing, um, we, have a, we need a little toolbox of, of spanners and wrenches we can use to try and shift traffic around. So, outbound traffic, um, we, we, we control our outbound traffic by controlling, like by changing how we process routes that we learn from other people. So we apply policy on the routes we learn from other people at the place where we learn them, because that's the easy place to do it. So we can have general policy. We can have a, a bunch of policies to do with uh, BGP attributes that apply to peering links. So we prefer some particular peering places to other places. Um, we prefer peering links over transit links. And we have a specific policy as well, which might be short-term policy or it might be a long-term policy, which is to say things like, if we want to transit, um, or we want to, we want to avoid a particular peering point for some reason, um, maybe because we have a congested interface there. Um, so we'd like to try and depress the routes we learn over there. So we'll still use them if we have to, but if we have any other routes elsewhere in the network, then that's probably a bad, better place to send the traffic. So here are some, some attributes that people commonly use to, uh, to change their their exit selection for particular routes. So local preference is a common one. 
um, very commonly used to, to, uh, to, to change the preference between customer and, uh, and peer routes to avoid some nasty oscillations. Um, MEDS, uh, AS path, different vendors have different BGP path selection algorithms. Um, so depending on who your vendor is, you may be able to go down and find uh, vendor specific knobs or, or other knobs that, that basically allow you to control the outbound traffic in a way that makes sense. So the idea of making all these changes is to do small changes if you can. Small changes and then pause and wait and wait and see what happens. Because there's a natural latency between things happening and people reacting to it. So uh, changing something and then looking and saying, well, you know, the, the interface stats seem reasonable now. Uh, the pings are no longer five, taking five seconds to go across this OC12. Um, everything must be okay, I'll go home now. That's not really a good approach. Um, the idea is to make very small changes and then basically repeat. So inbound traffic is a, is a, is a different sort of problem. Uh, inbound traffic and controlling where your inbound traffic comes um, is, trying to, is all about influencing policy in other networks. So you're talking about in, in, influencing basically the outbound policy of your peers and transit providers and also people in the world that have no connection to you whatsoever. So in general, this is a harder problem. Um, yeah. So some providers give some degree of control to their customers and peers to allow those people to influence the way that exit selection is done in those foreign networks. So uh, 1755, the who has record there, has, has an interesting selection of community strings you can set to influence the way routes are propagated through 1755 to other peers and customers. So lots of, lots of providers do this kind of thing. So you talk to your provider and people you directly talk to, you may find that there are particular community, string, community strings you can use to change the way that your, the routes that you advertise are treated by those other networks. And that can be a useful way of adjusting your inbound traffic. Um, cider abuse. If you advertise a long prefix, the chances are the traffic will follow that as long as people receive that long prefix and don't filter it. So, there are a bunch of networks around the place that do traffic engineering by advertising an overlapping set of prefixes. They might have a supernet, a slash 16 supernet, but for particular bits of traffic which they might prefer to advertise to, to, to receive over a different link, they'll advertise um, a slash 24 which is covered by that 16 down the other link. So they have a covering aggregate to make sure they don't lose any traffic. Um, but they're kind of gambling on the fact that people are going to listen to the slash 24 and send traffic that way. And anybody who doesn't will send the traffic to the aggregate. So the reason this is a, an effective thing is because longest prefix wins, wins is a very strong rule for trying to work out where to send packets in the forward table, forwarding table. Um, no amount of BGP policy is going to override the fact that if you have a longer prefix route, that's the route that's going to get used. And the reason it's bad is because you end up putting all kinds of extra straight into the routing table, uh, which is good for you, but the rest of the world has to endure it. So you're basically taking up space in all the routers of the world just for your own requirements, which is kind of rude. Um, and it adds to sort of scaling problems and con convergence problems and that kind of thing. AS path stuffing is another way to try and influence the, uh, the exit policy that other people use in other networks. So basically, if I'm AS5, instead of just advertising the route straight to another person, I'll stuff it five times with AS5. So the path length now looks like it's been through six ASs. So this is a very common, common thing, but unfortunately, AS path comes way down the list on, uh, on the BGP tiebreaker list. Um, so other people's local preference in MED is, is probably going to beat it. Uh, AS path pollution is a, is a particularly nasty trick that I learned from someone in Australia. Um, if I advertise a route over a particular circuit, and to suit my purposes, I really want to say, I want traffic to follow this link, but I never want traffic from, say, UUNet to come down this link. So what I'll do is I'll pre 701 onto the advertisement before I send it, which means that 7, 701 will never accept that route. So that's particularly nasty because it makes people very confused when they look at the path and say, hang on a second, you're transiting 701 traffic. Um, it can be very effective, but it can make things very confusing. Um, and also, some people will actually put some filters on their inbound policy and say, we won't accept a route from anybody if it appears that they're transiting 701 routes, in which case your route just doesn't get accepted at all. So, I mean, basically, all these kinds of things, you have no direct control over the policy in other people's networks. Um, so all these things are just things to try, to try and edge a little bit more traffic one way, uh, a little more traffic the other way. So you can try and sort of adjust the flow of traffic between different external links. So really this is just a, a summary of, uh, of the sort of slightly warning qualities of the, of the previous slide, which is that some of these things are going to have unwelcome effects in other people's networks. 
They might be unwelcome simply because it makes operation staff confused. You know, people might start saying, what the hell, I've just seen this weird thing in my routing table, and people might just waste time thinking about it. So even if the, uh, even if the net effect on the other network is completely benign, um, you can still waste people's time, and wasting people's time is not a good thing. So basically, we all have to play, nice, play nicely. That's, that's the answer here. So um, I guess it's a, it's a balance. We have to try and do what's best for our customers because they're paying us money. Um, but we don't really want to piss everybody else off in the world because if we do, none of them will talk to us, and that kind of defeats the purpose. So we have some conceptual sort of goals um, that Josh and I were sort of talking about, and we, we came up with a couple of questions that we thought might be quite common. So the conceptual example, the first one, is basically who is, who is chewing up my network resources? So we're concentrating now for the purposes of, of our little like, experimentation on outbound traffic. We're looking at where are we sending our traffic, um, And the reason we're looking at those sort of things is to try and control our outbound traffic. So we're looking at appropriate network expansion. Who should we peer with next? Um, we might have particular peers that we need to maintain traffic ratios with. So it may be good, for example, not to send traffic to a particular peer if we can avoid it. So the interesting thing is to try and find out of the traffic we are sending those people, if we're trying to reduce the amount of traffic we're sending, um, who are the main consumers of traffic beyond that AS, maybe we can peer with those people directly. So another example is um, trying to spot from traffic flows when people are doing things that they shouldn't necessarily be doing. So this one here, theft over IP is Josh's term. Um, I don't know the responsibility for that one. Uh, the idea is to say, if we have a peer, some of this peer may have a problem due to a misconfiguration or perhaps some more nefarious purpose, they are sending traffic to us which corresponds to routes that we are not sending them. So they might be using us as a default. They might suddenly have a, a te temporary problem that they can find they can relieve by sending traffic at us instead because they know our connection to, say, another PRAS is better than theirs. Um, and this is a thing that if you don't measure your network, you can never really tell what is going on until someone opens a trouble ticket. And if somebody may never open a trouble ticket because it may never cause anybody any problems. But even so, it's consuming your network resources from, by people who are, who are not paying you. The uh, Yahoo apparently are doing this kind of stuff. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about this one. Uh, Trevor Taven over at Yahoo uh, has done a lot of this stuff for a number of years now. Uh, he uses a comparing analysis and talking about you know, expanding cluefully. Sorry. Expanding your network cluefully, uh, you know, doing performance analysis and even doing some, some manner of, uh, you know, instead of letting BGP select routes for me, I'm going to do active measurement and I'm going to force it out different doors in my network and I'm going to determine for myself who the best, and when I say for myself, I mean him for himself, uh, what the best route is based on the performance characteristics and I'm going to select routes based on that. Uh, so they do all sort of, you know, custom macros for AS analysis, uh, uh, source and destination AS bandwidth details, where's my traffic going. I mean, all the stuff that we've been talking about, the folks at Yahoo have been doing for a while now. Uh, they do some stuff with chargeback billing. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about that. I'd, I'd have to ask Jeffrey about that. But uh, uh, DOS attack detection, uh, performance analysis on their backbone, mapping traffic statistics. Uh, onto their network and across their network as well as outbound off their network. Yahoo pushes a lot of data, so traffic to the biggest aggregation points off of their network is a really, really good thing for them. And then on, on the next slide, there's, there's a map that shows uh, uh, traffic that's going, syncing to one of their neighbor ASs and traffic that's transiting through their neighbor AS. And they actually view this in quasi real time, so uh, they can really see what a they can really see what's going on and uh, who they're really shipping a lot of data through. <coughs> okay, so the last few things we're going to talk about. This is an experience we had just recently over the past couple of weeks. Josh and I uh, threw some configuration onto some routers in the MFN network. Uh, and tried to have a look at some, to answer some problems that we thought might be useful to answer. So you'll find these examples are not tremendously heavy on details, to not have too many specifics in them, because uh, um, we have contracts with our peers that say that we're allowed to look at traffic data for the purposes of, uh, of traffic engineering, 
uh, as I think most people do, um, but they don't tend to cover sort of basically publishing that data and telling other people at a conference. So this is kind of sort of a little bit abstract, but uh, the principles I think should be quite clear. So here's a here's a network example that we, we that we tried to try to answer a question. So we appear with this particular large regional ISP in several places, uh, and we're congested towards them. So we're not congested all day or anything, honest, but uh, towards some of these people, uh, over some of these peering links at certain times of the day, we, we get kind of busy. Um, so what we're going to try and do is offload that. So who are the top people behind this, this large regional provider that we're talking to that we reach via them? So maybe we can peer with them directly. Um, and not just the endpoints, not just the final endpoints of the, the ASs that are actually syncing the traffic, but for example, what aggregation points exist between them? What tier two providers uh, or regional providers, or whatever you want to call them, behind this large ISP um, can we maybe talk to directly in order to offload uh, the congested peering circuits? So we had a little look at the network. And although a lot of the network is sort of pure core edge along the lines that Josh described in this diagram, um, there are other areas where it isn't. Um, there are other areas where it looks more like the ANS diagram. Um, for one reason or another, you know, expedience and availability of hardware, circuits get added where they need to get added. And people are not always thinking directly of measurement when they do it. So it's maybe not as convenient as we, as we would like, but we can probably still do something. So in this example, all the peering routers are GSR 12,000s. All the peering circuits are OC12. And most, in the, in the areas where we do have a hierarchical model, most of the links back to the core are OC48. So it's a GSR. We know we're doing sampling that flow and net flow anyway. Um, there are OC48 circuits involved, some of which are quite busy. So maybe the sampling ratio is not going to be particularly close to one-to-one -one because they don't want to flood the network with measurement data. <coughs> so the sampling thing is probably okay because we're looking at relative tra traffic volumes. We want to see for the, uh, for the two and through categories behind this large regional ISP, we want to be able to say, um, let's order these things by, by traffic to and traffic through and, uh, and, and sort them uh, and look at the people at the top of the list. So a couple of little things we found out. Turning on IP route cache flow sampled on an interface that didn't previously have it can cause, cause the router to sort of um, pause for a second and, and contemplate its existence and, and wonder what it's doing here. Uh, and while it's doing that, the traffic kind of goes everywhere. So as we, as we found out, um, doing that, turning that kind of thing on is, is good to do in advance or good to do in a maintenance window. And it's not particularly good to do at peak time. Um, inbound ACLs, as Josh mentioned, there's this contention for the feature set on inbound, uh, for, the, for the inbound traffic management stuff on a, on a line card. So we can't have ACLs running and expect to get NetFlow data as well. So a lot of interfaces, for one reason or another, will have some sort of, uh, will have some sort of ACL on them. Um, maybe peering links aren't necessarily the ones that do that. But in the parts of, parts of the network where we have multiple kinds of external links on a single router, so it's not purely, purely peering, we might have ACLs out towards a customer, for example. And if we have an outbound ACL, an outbound ACL on a GSR is, is actually implemented as an inbound ACL on all other interfaces. So that effectively wipes out NetFlow from the, from the entire router. So we have to turn off all the ACLs, and we have to talk to the people who put the ACLs on to find out whether it's appropriate to take them off. So these kind of things can take some time. Um, and again, this is a little hurdle that can, can stop you just measuring in five minutes after you thought of a question. Um, so we configure the, configure the, uh, the, the export hosts, the routers start sending the data, uh, and then a flood of data arrives and we, and we sit back and watch the disk nervously. So as I mentioned, what we're, what we're actually trying to get out of this data is a relative byte count through and two networks reached through the peering question. So if there's an AS one hop away, we want to know traffic that terminates in that AS, and traffic that goes through that AS, it doesn't actually terminate there because together that kind of gives an indication of how valuable that peer is uh, in terms of uh, peering or, or camping directly. And again, absolute numbers don't matter. <coughs> so this is, the, uh, this is some sample output from the tool that we used. Um, it's not actually from this example, it's from a different example. Um, but this is a, this is a tool uh, that Ixia make called, uh, called C-Flow, but you could use all kinds of other tools to try and do it. Um, in the past, I've done this by um, IX traffic, sorry. Uh, in the past, I've, I've done similar sorts of things by taking um, rather crude snapshots of the, of the rib, even just by script, expecting in a, a show IP BGP and trying to find out networks behind a peer, um, storing a state and saying, well, I have an approximate table now of, of routes that I learned through that peer. 
Um, so although it might not be sort of accurate up to the minute, it may be good enough to make a generalization. So we have some sort of idea of routes that are learned through a peer. Um, then, the, then what we do is try and match, <coughs> as Josh mentioned, the destination um, networks from the flow data we received, match them up, and try and work out what AS paths correspond to different amounts of traffic. And if you're familiar with C-flow, then what we're basically doing is building a C-flow type matrix. But it's, with AS path is, is, is what we're trying to measure the traffic for. So we're taking a, um, instead of just an origin AS or, or a next top, IGP next top, or some other unuseful thing, we're taking AS path, which is a useful thing, and saying for every AS path we see, how much traffic do we send that way. So the reason for this, this slide here is, is that it actually demonstrates it quite nicely. Um, so you can see for a particular AS, the P indicates that we already have a session with them. And you can see we have packets per second through, we have bits per second through, and we have a sorted list, which is useful to look at. <coughs> so we have another example now. We have somebody who comes towards us and says we, they want to peer. Um, and that's good, because we're good at peering, and we like doing peering with all kinds of people. Um, but this particular person says, we don't really want to peer across an exchange that you're already at, because we, we already consume a lot of your traffic. Um, you know, in fact, we, can, we, we say we consume 140 megs of your traffic at peak, so like a, a fast Ethernet connection over a peering exchange somewhere is probably a waste of time. Um, so we want to pay a P&I. We want to do a private peering connection straight away. So we want, they want us to allocate a port and do a direct interconnect with them. Now, it may be that we haven't really heard of ASR particularly much. Maybe they're kind of new. Uh, maybe we don't have any sort of um, conceptual way of trying to work out whether that's a reasonable thing for them to say. Uh, maybe they're just mistaken. So in any case, it would be nice to confirm the numbers and find out that we do really want to peer with them directly straight away and not waste our time with a, with a public connection. <coughs> so the answer we're trying to ask, uh, the question we're trying to answer is how much traffic are we sending to this, this, this uh, ASR? And uh, we currently reach them through some other AS, AST. And we peer with AST in, in a number of places. We have more complexities because some of the older peering exchanges um, still have some older routers on. And we have an overlap between this problem and the other problem. So we're going to end up getting flow data from one router that corresponds to both. Again, we have topology that is not edge core uh, throughout the whole, whole network. We want to get actual numbers out of this um, because we actually want to find an answer for how much traffic we're sending. Uh, and for various sort of uh, recent localized reasons, we keep having to apply ACLs to various interfaces because we get large amounts of sort of unwelcome traffic directed at our routers from various places. Um, which we have to, kind of, that kind of takes priority against measuring against some future peering things. So um, we're going to have holes in our data. And the chances are we're going to have holes in our data which don't correspond across the board because ACLs are unapplied everywhere simultaneously. So we might have one speaker that suddenly stops sending us NetFlow data for a while, um, and then another one that does it later, and we end up with this overlapping, overlapping picture. So Josh mentioned this here. We have, there are various tools that, I mean, MRTG will measure the traffic um, the, the inter, from the interface counters. So it will measure how much traffic you're sending across the interface. So to try and convert the relative numbers that we have, the sampled numbers that we have, uh, to absolute numbers of bits per second, we can take uh, a bunch of data which represents the throughput on an interface obtained through SNMP counters, or from counters obtained by SNMP, um, and we can divide that up in proportion to what traffic we think we're interested in. So there's probably some more to say about this. So the, the problem with the 7500, we kind of sidestepped, because it turned out that was a public peering arrangement where the routes were so sort of um, so deep prepped, we weren't sending any traffic there anyway. So we could actually reduce the set of AST peerings, which we have to bother about, by looking at the realities of how the routes were being deep prepped through existing policy. So we could go through and say, um, of those original six peering places, uh, in fact, there's only four we have to worry about, uh, because the other ones just basically aren't used. The routes that are never normally selected. Um, we did the trick with uh, the MRTG thing. Well, actually, we have a tool called Duck, which does the same thing. So we could divide up and get absolute numbers for the, for the throughput to AST that corresponded to traffic that was going through or to ASR. And the problem with the, uh, with the overlapping problem statement turned out to be not a problem at all. Um, it's very trivial, basically, because none of the traffic that we were, we were counting with the other provider, obviously, was uh, had a next top of AST. 
um, because it's all going to spaces in the other provider, which is not AST. So the fact that we had data from the same router answering both problems was just not an issue because we could sort the data very easily and say problems, traf uh, data which corresponds to this question, uh, which we will use to make an answer, all has AST as the first next hop, which is a very simple way of, of spitting all traffic out that only corresponds to this problem. The problem with the, uh, with the ACLs that kept appearing and disappearing in various parts of the network um, was a little bit more annoying to try, and, to try and spot. We could spot holes and find out where we didn't get flow data with an X-top of AST from a router in a period of time, which is a fairly good indication that an ACL was put on. Um, but it also could be something to do with the fact that there was some other routing policy going on. Maybe somebody changed the, uh, the, the routing policy due to a connect, congested interface and deep a connection, which meant suddenly we stopped sending traffic that way. Um, so the only real good way of, of tracking this down, which was kind of a crude way of doing it, is we have, a, we have a tool called Rancid that probably many people are familiar with, which keeps track of our configurations in our routers uh, and stores them in CVS. So we have a complete configuration history of sampled configurations which are polled every half hour. So with half hour granularity, we can spot where an ACL has been applied to an interface um, and therefore discount the, 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 basically the entire pool of data for AST for the uttering this problem um, during that period while we have any ACL on any of the interfaces we're talking about. So the problem with doing this when you have a lot of ACLs being applied and pulled off and when you have a half hour granularity is you end up with not necessarily an awful lot of periods of time where you can measure traffic. And also the periods where you can measure traffic might span a couple of weeks but might correspond to different times of day, um, different times of, times of week, and might not necessarily be representative of traffic flow during the entire period. So the ideal answer here is to try and beat on the vendors and make sure you can do ACLs and sample net flow at the same time. Um, but absent that, the other thing is to try and do is just keep the ACLs off the router while you're doing the measurement. So this is our summary. The problems that we tried to track down during our experimentation just over the last couple of weeks were ad hoc questions. They were particular questions with, with very specific um, sort of problem ranges. Um, and we tried to add configuration to the network to try and pull, those answers, to pull data out and answer those questions. So we found out that, uh, well, we've, we've really just completed the measurement stage. The next stage would be to actually go and make changes uh, in the case of the first example. Uh, and to do that in an iterative manner. So we'll try and try and uh, adjust the traffic flow in a slow, sort of controlled way, and then re-measure and see what changed. We didn't actually happen to measure from any Juniper routers because none of the questions concerned had any Juniper routers involved in them. Um, and we didn't attempt to build a full-time general purpose measurement infrastructure to answer these questions in a general way. That seems like a much harder question. Um, but it might be sort of uh, manageable for smaller networks, but when you have a few hundred routers involved, um, the collection infrastructure can be a sort of non-trivial sort of thing to, to design. And we also didn't talk about edge flows where the edge router doesn't have any sort of flow export. Um, I mean, there are other boxes we can, that are apparently are available that you can insert in the physical transport path to a router which will generate net flow records. So, if, for example, if you have a router that you are unable or unwilling to generate net flow data from, there are vendor selling boxes where you can plug in um, into an OC12 or an OC3 or something like that, which will generate net flow data from the line. So in a, in a kind of passive way. So I mean, there are, there are solutions to that sort of thing, but we didn't have to try any of that because uh, we were quite happy to turn net flow on the routers. So that is it. Are there any questions? Can you uh, talk a little bit about the impact of sampling data all the time? What, what kind of traffic do you see? What sort of hardware do you need to back up? Well, the traffic that we, that, we, that we recorded, the flow data that we recorded in these examples, um, we used basically a FreeBSD box at one point in the network with, I think, a 20 gig disk on it, which we just watched. Um, and if we need to move things off an archive from somewhere else, we did that. But we certainly didn't need um, a huge sort of uh, humongous data store in order to actually answer this question. And then, like, how, much, how much flow data was generated by capturing? Do you happen to notice how much data? Um, but one, one thing we should mention is that we weren't recording the raw flows. Uh, we, were, we were manipulating the raw flows into aggregation tables, <laughs> uh, and then we were throwing away the raw flows, which you, know, you may or may not choose to do. So our, our requirements for disk usage were substantially less because of that. I think, uh, how many routers were there total, like 12? 
something like that. Something like 12 routers, and all of them were doing one and a hundred samples. Yeah. Um, some number, you know, between three and eight high-speed interfaces, OC12, OC48. And I want to guess that per router we were collecting something like 12 mega day, 20 mega day, something like that. I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it sounds it, reasonable. It wasn't just a, it wasn't an order, order of magnitude off of from that. So as long as we were keeping the the aggregation tables and not the raw flows, which are voluminous and can chew up this really fast. The this requirement was not automatic. We were not exporting V5 directly. We were we were exporting V5 directly, but we were not keeping storable records of these. Yeah, we, we were basically using the data to populate that AS path matrix, and once the matrix had been populated, we threw the data away. So I mean, we could do that because we're answering specific questions, um, even sort of semi-specific questions like um, AS path matrices across the network, which still allow you to answer general questions. Um, they don't contain all the data that you could be able to go back and say, well, what actually happened last Tuesday? Because now that we know this, in fact, there was some sort of spike here which caused a problem. So let's go investigate it. So we've, we've discarded that data by that point. So with the way we measured for this, for this example, we couldn't tell that, we couldn't answer that question. Can we comment on the dollar implications of doing measurement for traffic engineering? I think the answer is that we didn't talk directly about dollars. Uh, and Josh will probably have something to say about this as well. We didn't talk directly about dollars. Um, apart from references to, to Josh and snake oil. Um, but basically the idea is that if you have a, a problem in your network that you need to solve, then a very sort of tempting way to solve it, if you have unlimited money, is just to go out and upgrade everything. So if you think one circuit to someone is congested, then you can just go and buy a bigger circuit or buy another circuit. Um, and you can keep doing that. The idea of doing traffic engineering is you don't necessarily have to do that. That's not the only way to answer the question. So if we have a particularly congested peering circuit towards this particular person, um, or transit circuit, then there may be alternatives to upgrading it straight away. We may be able to go out and, and gather other peering, uh, other, uh, other peering sessions across public exchanges where we already are, uh, and basically lower the cost of delivering our traffic without congestion, um, and, re and, that, and that way save spending the money. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, VJ's big bit is that uh, in order to do traffic engineering, you require traffic. Uh, SANS traffic, you can do very little traffic engineering or very little worthwhile traffic engineering. Uh, and over the last number of years, I mean, a lot of the major carriers and even a lot of the smaller carriers have found that they have just oodles and oodles of internal capacity, right? I mean, and when you have an internal capacity problem, you know, you throw another link at it and therefore you don't, and even though they've spent, you know, a hundred, hundred thousand hours designing internal traffic engineering systems, there's enough existing internal uh, network uh, fiber, if nothing else, that allows people to really throw bandwidth at the problem. Interdomain, that doesn't tend to be the case. Uh, you know, if I'm provider X and Joe's provider Y, well, I'm sure we both have plenty of fiber, but not between each other. Um, so there's costs with external relationships. Uh, there's costs with ports, there's costs with administrative costs, there's costs with there, there, there's costs with, with having interdomain links to be able to get the biggest bang for your buck by figuring out whom am I going to dedicate an expensive uh, router port to uh, because, you know, who am I going to go peer with? Uh, you may be p paying those people because you're buying transit. You may be paying those people because your traffic ratio ratios are such that uh, you're paying a settlement fee. You might be lucky enough to just be a standard peer, and that's great, but there's still costs associated with that. Uh, if you are paying settlement fees to some upstream provider, uh, you're paying settlement fees because you qualify as a peer, but your tra traffic ratios don't quite uh, meet their criteria. Using this to make your traffic ratios fit into their criteria can obviate costs for you. Uh, and then, you know, the other example is just clearly, you know, using this stuff to go find the consumers of your, of your bandwidth and consumers of your resources. Those are people that use the stuff that you provide, and those are sales opportunities. And I don't, I don't want to stand up here, you know, with my sales hat on and tell you guys to go off and sell to everyone because it's not really, you know, what the nano gig's about. But there are really good reasons to do this stuff to drive revenue and to save costs. BGP accounting is pretty useful, except you need a priori knowledge of what you're looking for. Um, I, and so for the second example, you could use that. Um, the, the problem with, with that is that if you don't know exactly what you want or if you think that what you want may change based on what you learn or if you need to know more than six buckets or eight buckets, I can't remember the number, um, 
it's useful in the same space, but it's pretty limited. You have to know exactly what you need to know ahead of time and need to measure it in the right places, although you do with here too. But I, I think of this as a much more flexible approach to answering a much broader scale of questions. But like DCU and uh, the, the bucket of counters for BGP uh, do have some app application in the same space. Again, you know, memory uh, uh, usage on the box, some of the same uh, issues in, uh, in deploying it, uh, especially on the Cisco's with the iOS issue. But yeah, I think it's on the list. It's somewhere further down the list too. So if you're doing sample NetFlow and and uh, DCU or the Cisco equivalent, That's right. yeah. So so yeah, you can use that in some places. Other questions? One more. You can do it. No? And of course, you measure number in your presentation. Say again? Well, how much time is this kind of course you make number you refer to? 140 meg number. Which 140 meg number? You're talking about here. 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 You're talking about Oh, that was their claim of how much traffic they exchanged. No, I think they were talking about a peak demand. So if we're going to avoid congestion. Per second at peak load. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, the, uh, the analysis is still ongoing on that one. I so We haven't quite decided it yet. Yeah, we have some answers, but we haven't checked them enough to decide them. Have you worked in that environment? There's some architectural constraints, but there's a harder problem. Anything else? Thanks for sitting through it.